Good morning, streaming family. Let's greet our streamers in Jesus' name. Put your hands together. Welcome. I hope you're hungry. I hope you're thirsty because I've got a delicious feast for you. We are in uh, our series called Discern 11, and we're talking about guidance part two. Now, last week we looked at some very important issues with regard to guidance. And we looked at the fact, first of all, that scripture is first and foremost our foundation for all that we believe, what the Bible says in context. But second to that, there's the inner witness. This moves us to the subjective category where we need to be sensitive because the Holy, we are temples of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, God, the third person of the Trinity, dwells inside of us. So we're going to get some direct information that we need to be sensitive to. How many times have you sensed something's wrong about a business dealing or an individual? You didn't know what it was. That's the inner witness. We have to be sensitive to that. Third, prophetic confirmation. That's when God will send an individual or individuals with a prophetic word and it's very important that we be sensitive to this the, there's a whole section of the body of christ that says this is demonic and uh if you ever say you're getting a prophetic confirmation that you're asking demons into your heart well god bless them but they've just cut off a major level of god's guidance that would lead them uh, i remember the full gospel businessman international that was founded by demas shikarian who is uh, an Armenian brother, um, his family, Shikarian's family, were in Armenia. And they were the ones who were told, leave the Pentecostals in Armenia were told, you're all going to die, leave now. And all of the conservatives, as we call them, the cessationists, mocked the prophetic words the Pentecostals received. The Pentecostals, including Demas Shikarian's family, all left Armenia. And the Turks came in and slew 1.5 million, killed everybody. And it was only the Pentecostal church that had an ear to hear and was open to prophetic confirmation that was told, get out now. And they were mocked by all their uh, conservative denominational brethren who refused such a word as being demonic. So uh, it's important you get these categories straight because your life could depend on it in many situations. So after prophetic confirmation, we found out that there is um, there is counsel. We have to surround ourselves with a multitude of counselors. There's peace, the peace of God. We have peace with God when we're saved, but we need the peace of God to guide our inner cadence when it comes to making decisions. And then finally, there's provision where God guides, he provides. So today we're going to continue our guidance, part two, and we're going to be looking at what I would move us back to the circumstantial guidance of God. We're going to look at six circumstantial storms. And it's important to know the category of a storm, right? Is it one? Is it two? Is it three? Is it four? Well, we're going to look at six categories of storms that circumstantially, they fall all under the heading of circle circumstantial guidance. Remember, circumstances involve the immediate circumstances surrounding you. So they can be speaking to you. So we want to be alert to all, of course, what God says primarily in context but then inner witness prophetic sensitivity a multitude of counselors beloved you have people surrounding you that see you in a way you can't see yourself so to leave any of these counsel contexts out any of these facets could cost you a lot of trouble now we're going to make mistakes in life but they don't need to be fatal and lethal mistakes so that's why we want to just review a little bit of last week. But today we're going to look at six circumstantial storms. And in fact, I have a handout. Um, if you could pass these around, Nancy. I just remembered I asked Mike to make the handouts today, and there they are. And those of you looking online, you can click, and Mike has already put them online for you. So if you want to click, you can get these as well. Six circumstantial storms. If I knew this 50 years ago, my life would have gone in a different set of trajectories. And I think we could all say amen to that. So the youngins, get this down now. These have been distilled over a lifetime of failure 
into a context in which you don't ever need to fail. You'll fail, but it doesn't need to be lethal to your marriage, doesn't need to be fatal to your ministry and to your moral character, all right? So the first circumstantial storms, they're called Jonah storms. What category of storm is this? These are storms due to our own personal foolishness. This is you being an idiot. There are storms that come just because you are doing idiotic things and you're young and you're immature and you won't listen to wise counsel and you won't surround yourself with wise counselors. So these are the kind of storms that hit because you're an idiot. Jonah storms. It says Jonah 1, 1 through 3, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and he headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish and fled from the presence of the Lord. So this is what you never do. <laughs> Notice he went down 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 and down when you disobey god you go down he went down to tarshish he went down into the boat then he went down into the water then he went down into the belly of the great fish that had gastronomical tastes only for prophets named jonah so god sent a storm after him notice it wasn't the devil that sent a storm or god allowed a storm god sent the storm and he sent the fish so there was no God functioning in his permissive will here. He causatively and actively sent the storm, wasn't the devil, and he sent a fish so that when the storm would cause everyone on the ship to throw him overboard, there was a, uh, a prayer hotel waiting for him, for him to be caught in the fish hotel for three days. And notice that fish took him all the way back to the original point where he had left from Joppa. So this man is an example of the storm that comes because you brought it on yourself. There's no one to blame but you. And isn't it good news? The, the operable guidance word here is repent. You say, Craig, I'm in a Jonah storm. I, I got, nobody has anything to do with this but me. Now, now, some things in life, there's mixture, okay? It could be you a little bit and your wife mostly, which, which of course, you know. Um, but uh, she won't hear you, you know, because she's just that way. But sometimes it's just you, Jonah. And when it is, God sends a storm and he sends a fish. His goal is for you to repent so that you can go right back to your starting point. And then Jonah 3, 1 kicks in that says, and the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. I don't know how many I'm talking to that the Lord, word of the Lord has come to you a second time, a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time, because God is merciful. Aren't you glad that he doesn't pour out justice on us? right? But he pours out mercy. And I don't know about you, but I don't want justice ever. I want mercy. Craig is a mercy man, duct tapes the mercy button and sits on that 24 hours a day. Amen. Get all you can, can all you sit and sit in the lid, get all you can, whatever that is. I don't know what that is. Yeah. 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 Get all you can. Yeah. Mike knows it. He's tired of hearing it. You say that every other sermon. That's because I mean to. So Jonas, <laughs> Jonah storms are you. The second kind of storm, category two storm, is the disciple storm. These are storms that come simply to develop character, maturity, and trust. Did you know that there are some storms that come and they're not moral judgments of you? It's not a see if you see you can make category mistakes here. If you miss read any of these six categories of storms and you call the wrong one. If you think this is a Jonah storm, then you're going to believe that you're getting your comeuppance. And in a, the second storm, the disciple storm, these are storms that come simply to develop character, maturity, and trust. Remember Mark 4, 35 and 40. It says, that day when evening came, he said to the disciples, let us go over to the other side. He didn't say, let's go halfway and sink. The operative word was, let us go to the other side. And my counsel for you, if it's a disciple's storm, row in the power of the last word God gave you because it's still true. 
Until God gives you a new word, row in the power of the last word he gave you because it's still true. We live in a time where everybody wants a new prophetic word every day and they go to different prophecy meetings every night and they want to get a new word. Well, beloved, you're supposed to learn to row into the power, row in the power of the last word because it's still true. And the disciples were told, we're going to the other side. Now they get halfway there and all the elements converge against them. And Jesus, our precious Lord, is asleep in the boat. So they're terrified because they've gotten their eyes on the wind and the waves. And they've gotten their eyes off the fact that Jesus is fast asleep. So he's evidently not concerned about anything. But they go wake him up with this idiocy. Master, carest thou not? that we perish. Boy, when you go wrong, you go way wrong. Have you noticed that? You start accusing the Lord of not caring. You know, you brought us all the way out here and Jesus gets up and says, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? I already told you to go to the other side. I didn't say go halfway and sink. So beloved, row in the power of the last word God gave you because it's still true. Now, I've got about 6,000 prophetic words in my prophecy closet. But you know what? If they're of God, they'll come to pass. So I don't sweat over them and I don't go and reread them all the time. Because if God speaks, he will confirm his word. And I'm not interested in fantasies I have about me coming to pass. I want the word that God last spoke to me coming to pass. So keep rowing in the power of the last word he gave you because it's still true. So that's a storm that comes and it developed their character, it developed their maturity and their capacity to trust in the Lord. And after this experience, the operative word here in this kind of a storm is endure. You just show up and you just endure and you're going to make it not halfway in sync. You're going to make it all the way to the other side. And the scripture says that they did make it all the way to the other side. Isn't that good news that God is not a liar? His word is true. So just keep rowing in the power of the true word he last gave you. Now, God's promises are one thing. His performances are another thing. His promises are really simple, and they're in uh, big print in, in, in the newspaper. But his performances usually are in Aramaic, in fine print. He didn't tell you we're going to go to the moon and then to Mars and then through a labyrinth and then you'd arrive. So his promises are usually clear and they're in bold print, but the performances can be a little bit more difficult and a little bit more nuanced. Amen. So remember, they were told in big print, the Messiah is coming. They didn't understand anything more about that. They didn't know it was a God man. They didn't know it was a second person of the Holy Trinity. They didn't know that he was going to look just like them. They didn't know that he was going to be loved by the common people and pretty much insult the religious fools. They didn't know nothing about Jesus was anything they were expecting. But beloved, I would say their expectation fault was on the religious leaders because the scriptures were clear and they were clear in giving the headlines and they were clear in the details. And if these men really would have had a heart for God and they would have loved the word of God, they would have recognized the word of God incarnate when he walked up to them and said, hello. Remember John the Baptist came saying he's coming and they cast John out as a devil and they cut his head off. And then Jesus came and said, I'm here. And they said, how can we best agree to kill him? So they, they wouldn't agree on anything theologically except to kill Jesus. So that isn't the proper response I would suggest to Christ coming. Uh, and when he comes to his church in our time, people want to kill him too. Whenever the Spirit of God begins to move in a new massive move of revival, the majority of the conservative wing of the body of Christ, the cessationists say, it's demons, it's the devil, look and be afraid. If you worship with Hillsong music, you're asking demons into your heart. Really? You see, we've got the same tension in our time that Jesus had in his time. He faced the threat of murder from a religious spirit and with all the wondrous things we're postured to see God do in this last outpouring of the Holy Spirit will be attacked by the church. That's what the devil will use, religious spirits to bring the attack. So when it happens, you can say you heard it here from Greg Stimson. All right. 
So after Jonah storms, that's all about you. We have disciple storms, which are only designed to develop your character and your maturity and your trust. So the point is endure. Just learn the lesson. The third kind of category of storm I call Paul storms. Now, these are storms that open wider opportunities to greater ministry. Now, in Acts 27, 23 to 26, Paul says, he's on a ship. He says, last night, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. Now, the Apostle Paul is on a ship in Acts chapter 27, and the Lord sends an angel to comfort him. Why? Because the ship is going to break into a million pieces and be shrapneled and shattered. And he's going to wind up in the water with all the people that have been in the boat, which God promised, not one of them will die. I'm, I've given you everyone in that boat, Paul, because of you and my favor on you. If they obey you and they jump when you say jump and they get off when you say get off and they hold on to pieces of the boat, the ship will be destroyed. That instrumental vessel you're on right now will be destroyed, but you will live and they will live. So guess what? They obeyed Paul. And he told the man, we've all, if they jump off and they go in, we're going to make it. They're right outside of an island called Malta, beautiful island. Last time I was near it, they wouldn't let us in. So I wasn't able to go and see the very beach Paul landed on. That was a little upsetting, but I saw it from the ship. And I tried to imagine what it looked like when they are holding on to pieces in this beautiful aquamarine water. And they're seeing the island of Malta. Well, guess what, Paul? Everything Paul said happened. So they had every ground to doubt, but they trusted the man of God. And it says he grabbed a piece of the broken ship. You know, it's like maybe the ministry you're in is going to collapse, but you'll, you'll float out on a piece. Amen. Can't guarantee your denomination is going to turn to bits, but you're going to make it. And so he literally grabs onto a bit of the boat and, and they just swim in leisurely and they land on the island of Malta. Now, these storms, these Paul storms are storms that represent opening a wider opportunity for ministry. Now, when he got to Malta, that opened a whole new venue of ministry. Sometimes the category of storm that's hitting you is a blessing. It's just going to open up greater doors for ministry. So don't label each storm as equal. Job storms are you being an idiot. All right. The disciple storms are you getting character developed and you're learning to trust God in new ways and you're going to make it. So row in the power of the last word he gave you. It's still true. But this concept of the Paul storms, the operative guidance word is hold on, hold on to the power of the last word God gave you, because no matter what it looks like, you're going to survive. How many times in life have you come into a situation like that, that all the facts and circumstances look one way, namely, you are all going to die. Point one, point two, C, point one. That's how bad it can look. But Paul had the prophecy and the word of the Lord that he was no doubt reminding all of his fellow floaters about as they were moving towards Malta. Hold on. It's okay. We're, yeah, the ship's broken up. I know. But remember, the Lord said, you know, it, it's hard to follow a prophet sometimes and, and worse to follow an apostle. I told you, John Dawson told me apostle, an apostle is a fool of a man that stumbles out into absolute absurdity, requiring all the other giftings to come out and save his life. That's an apostle. So you trip, you fall down 16 flights of stairs and the other gift ministries keep you from breaking your bones. All right. Well, that sort of dirties it up a bit, doesn't it? <laughs> you say, I think I'm an apostle, brother. I think you might be. All right. So. Paul storms are the third kind. The fourth kind are Stephen storms. Now, these are storms where something needs to die for a greater good to be achieved. Something needs to die for something greater, a greater good to be achieved. If you remember Acts 7, 57 and 58, 
It said, At this they covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices, and they all rushed into him, and they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of the young man named Saul. Beloved, Stephen Storms are situations where God will give a deacon to get an apostle. So where our word of faith, brethren, go south is in this category. They say, well, if you have enough faith and your belief is correct, you're never going to have hard times. Nothing bad's ever going to happen to you, except in a Stephen storm. In a Stephen storm, God was willing to give up a deacon for the greater good of getting an apostle. This man, Saul, was the future Paul, the Saul of Tarsus. There he was. They laid the garments at his feet because he was the one ordering the killing of Stephen. So here's Stephen. If you want to read one of the best sermons in the world, read all of Acts chapter 7, and you will see one of the greatest sermons in the history of the world. It's remarkable, absolutely remarkable. And there's just something to learn. He, he goes over the entire history of the Old Testament and shows how Christ is the redemptive Messiah, and he's the king of all of that. And so there's something beautiful about this sermon, but he preached one sermon and then is going to die. And this is something that was necessary to impact Saul of Tarsus. Later, when he became a believer, he was surrounded by this testimony. It was the testimony of this holy man. The Bible says his face shone as an angel as he was being stoned, that he saw Christ standing at the right hand of the Father, welcoming the first Christian martyr into the portals of glory. What a sight to behold. And it says that Stephen's face shone, and then it says he gave up the ghost. So Stephen's storms are those storms where God is willing, he is willing to sacrifice a lesser thing for a greater good to be achieved. And you know what our response to that is? Die well. Die well. Don't die like masks. Remember Jim Carrey dying all over the set? Oh, ah, ee, oh, ah. Don't do that. Just die well. Just let your face glow. Let everybody see you in your last moment. They get a taste of glory as you're going into glory. And he is the first Christian martyr in the history of the world. Isn't that precious? And the Lord Jesus stands up at the right hand of the Father to honor him and to bring him into glory. What a beautiful story. And what a lovely category of storms. So Stephen's storms are blessed. But you've got to know what storm you're dealing with. Do you see how important it is? Die well if it's a Stephen storm. Fifth, Job storms. Now these are storms of mystery, never to be resolved on earth. You say, well, Craig, I think that's my storm. Well, it, <laughs> that's the storm of the super spiritual sometimes. But <laughs> these are storms that are never going to be understood in this life. And so no one knows. And the more you try to explain Job storms, the deeper into sin you fall. Remember Job's friends? First they came and they shut up and they laid down and they covered themselves with sackcloth and ashes for seven days. And the Bible says they did not sin with their lips during that time. Then they tried to help Job out. And they start telling all the stuff you hear nowadays. Well, there's sin in your life, Job. Gotta be. Because the curse causeless will not land. Uh, there's, you're unbelieving, God. You're fearful about your children, and you're making sacrifices out of fear. Now, what's interesting is the first and second chapters of Job says, God says he didn't sin with his lips. So the whole branch of the body of Christ that says he did something wrong that brought this on, God himself said he didn't. So God's right, the Bible's right, and somebody's wrong. So... Job storms represent a tertium quid. They're a third alternative. It isn't that you're, you're, you, you, you don't have enough faith or there's sin in your life. Those, those are two. This is a tertium quid. This, these are storms of mystery that you will never understand until you get to heaven. There's one word in heaven. Oh, 
And that's the word you hear with regard to Job storms. So you say, Craig, my storm is a, is a Job storm. I th well, which, whichever one reflects best on you, probably you think initially is your storm. But <laughs> you say, it's a mystery, it's a mystery. Well, ask the people around you. There's usually no mystery to your history. We'll let you know a few things that might account for an awful lot of these. Do you see why we need a multitude of counselor, counselors in our life, even with these six categories of storms? Because your sinful nature is going to lean to the one that pumps your flesh up. It sounds the best. Mine are Job storms. Ask us. We keep seeing you shooting yourself in the foot, and we're clear and certain it's a Jonah storm in your case. <laughs> but that's why you don't see most people ask for counsel they're looking for an accomplice most people will not subject themselves to maybe to one person they know they'll that will rubber stamp them notice it's a multitude of counselors that we're to be open to in the body of christ that means you don't just ask dennis you ask david and then you ask mike and then you ask nancy god forbid you don't know what she's going to say She'll tell you the truth, though. She's nice, but she'll tell you the truth. If God shows her something, she'll be honest. Ask Mark. Ask the lawyer. He'll, he'll be uh, charming and diplomatic, but he'll tell you the truth, too. And ask Joelle. She'll just tell it straight up <laughs> without any garments covering it. Amen. I mean, really, who do you want to talk to? Don't you want a multitude of counsel that's going to give you all six of these and tell you the hard truth? Because things will never change until your categories get straightened out with regard to these six circumstantial storms. So we have Jonah storms where it's all you. We have disciple storms where you're just going to get your character and your maturity and your trust developed. We've got the Paul storms. These are the storms that will open wider doors of opportunity so we don't want to curse those then we have stephen storms which these are the ones where something lesser is given up for god to win a greater good and then finally job storms these are all mystery and the operative word is this is when you can't trace him trust him beloved when you can't trace him trust him and do the next right thing that's in front of you I'll never tire of saying it because it's the counsel that would have transformed my life 50 years ago. Do the next right thing. Row in the power of the last word he gave you. It's still true. It's still true. Until he gives you a new word, you need to stay with the old one. Amen. Sometimes. And what is the devil doing through all these storms? He's attacked. First, he's trying to get us to confuse the six storms and apply the wrong ones to our situation. Now that'll be blocked by a multitude of counsel. Now one person in your life that's counseling you can be blinded to the facets of your diamond that need scrubbing and correction and polishing. But a multitude of counselors, especially the people that you know are going to tell you the truth, those are the ones you want to go to. You can wince a little bit and prepare for a, for a strike. But you really want to succeed, right? You really want to do what's right. You really want to flourish in God. So you need a multitude of counsel for that to happen. And the, after Job, we have the final form of storms. Category six is Christ storms. And these are storms of persecution that come because you're just doing the right thing. Remember the Lord said and. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12, blessed are those who perse are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Operative guidance word, when it is a storm, a Christ storm, rejoice rejoice because great is your reward in heaven jesus said remember they persecuted all the prophets that you studied and learned about and memorized scriptures about they persecuting me i'm the messiah you belong to me you're no better than i am last time i looked so if i get persecuted and all the prophets were persecuted 
and they went through every form of sick circumstantial storm, so are you. You're not immune. You're not exempt. There's no string you can pull and button you can push that's going to make you immune to these six circumstantial storms. The only gift you can have is wisdom to discern which of the six are hitting you at any given time. And you know, what's interesting, what the devil will do is he'll hit one brick a thousand times. He won't hit a thousand bricks once. He hits one brick a thousand times. So you will find in one of these six storms enough of a resonance in your spirit to go, wow, he's, I think he's always hitting me with uh, uh, number, uh, number four storms. I think he's hitting me with number three storms. They're all here, and these are all encompassing. The six are complete. And this form of discernment to me is life-saving. If you know the seven ways God guides that we studied last week and reviewed today, if you know the six circumstantial storms, this is all the data that you need. If you want to get more into it, then memorize the verses of Scripture that I've clearly typed out for you. Memorize where those indexicals are because when you're attacked in the middle of the night, sometimes you don't know your name under assault. But if this is hidden in your heart, that you may not sin against him, if you hide these principles, you can just go like that. I need guidance. What have I not done? Okay, I haven't gone to the Bible. What does the Word of God say in its totality and context? Okay, I haven't gone to talk to Dennis. I haven't called, not called Nancy. I haven't called Mike Fuller. Everyone in this room has an insight if you ask them. But if you don't ask, unsolicited advice is always a curse, even in your case. So open your heart. Surround yourself with as many counselors as you can. Hopefully those that have heard this message and have some acquaintance with these six categories of storms. I want to pray for you right now. Oh, beloved, wherever you are in your life, whatever you're facing, I pray that a clarity from heaven will drop down, that coins will drop in the coin bank. Nickels will go in the nickel slot, quarters will go in the quarter slot, nickel, and pennies will go in the penny slot, dimes will go in the dime slot. I pray that with this teaching, you will find the name of which of the six storms are consistently buffeting you, and that you would learn these principles that you open your heart to the correction and instruction of God's holy word. It's all here the last two weeks. You are called to be able to discern. That is the greatest gift you are given. The world needs your discerning gift. The body of Christ needs your discerning gift. Your family of origin, your, your children need you to be a discerning man or woman so that you can understand these principles that we've gone into. So, Lord, wrap this all up, Holy Spirit, with signs and wonders. Confirm the words that have been spoken in this discern series. And we ask that Jesus Christ, our Lord, would be glorified. Amen. Can you put your hands together? David is going to come and, and lead us at the ta in the table of the Lord. If you're at home, you go ahead and get your elements together as David passes them out. He's always got a a word he's got testimonies today he's got a multitude set of them to encourage your faith god bless you we love you and if we are blessing you please feed us in turn please send your offerings we appreciate it you can go online and you can set up a monthly gift you can set up uh, just a one-time gift but we would just encourage you if we fed you to take the time to make a note to feed us amen Bless you, brother. Here he is, the man of God. Welcome, everybody, to Bethel. Welcome to the table of the Lord. It's a beautiful time to just be with him, celebrate what he's done for us through his broken body and through his shed blood. I feel like, you know, the Holy Spirit, the last, you know, few months and years, has really been revealing to me, you know, all the health benefits that Jesus died to present to all of us. And I, I've had a bunch of different health issues. And I just wanted to say I'm in perfect health. <laughs> I just had a checkup a couple of weeks ago. 
my PSA went from 6.3, which is a little dangerous, down to 4.9. You know, I didn't do anything for that other than to trust my Lord. Anyway, I was in Psalms. Psalms 105 says that God brought out the Israelites and none were feeble. And I've known this before, and I thought, wow, what an amazing miracle that is. There were 600,000 men, so when you add women and children, think about that. And think about what they did in Egypt. Back-breaking work. I mean, injury and suffering, and they all came out, and none were feeble. And then the Lord reminded me, they ate the roasted lamb, and they ate the unleavened bread. What a foreshadow of what Jesus, the true Lamb of God, would do. And the Israelites had faith in that word, and they did consume the Lamb. So let's have faith in the true Lamb of God, who suffered for us, allowed his body to be broken, so that ours may be healed. Let's break that, and let's partake. That same night, when the Israelites did that, they took the blood and they put it on the doorposts of their house so that death would pass over them and they would be completely protected. You know, they had to work to do that. They had to work to paint it on there. All we have to do is believe. Jesus died for your sins to erase all the problems, all the judgment, all the condemnation against you is gone Let's praise his name and let's partake. You are the beloved of the Lord on whom his favor rests. And I want to take this moment right now. Uh, tomorrow morning, I'm going to go into Dr. Fahid Tawansi, a very trusted uh, uh, ophthalmologist, and he's going to be doing a surgery on my left eye here. I had a stroke seven years ago in my right eye, and he did a surgery removing a cataract and and so on. And they're going to do that tomorrow morning at 830. So I just wanted to get in on this moment with David standing here. And if you all just maybe would extend your hands and agree for the Lord to protect and bless and, and do all blessings tomorrow and preserve and protect. Thank you, Father, for our beloved pastor. Thank you. We, we, we just put him in your care right now. And I pray an anointing of healing, of peace. I pray for supernatural wisdom and skill for the doctor that's going to perform this. Guide and direct his hands, Lord. And let this outcome be perfection. You've already paid for it in advance, and we're thanking you right now that we're so happy that Pastor Craig is in your care and that you've got him enveloped with your love, your concern, and you're the great shepherd leading and guiding him. Craig will not be in any lack now or tomorrow. And thank you, Lord. Thank you that you're such a good, faithful, trustworthy God. And we're just going to entrust Craig to you right now. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you, precious lambs. God bless you. We love you. Have a wonderful week. We hope today's message has been a blessing to you. And if it has, please visit our website at drcraigjohnson.org. There you can find additional messages of encouragement. And if our ministry has been a blessing to you, please consider us in your ministry giving, as we depend solely on the financial assistance of our listeners like yourself. Also, please feel free to send any personal prayer requests. You can find us online at drcraigjohnson.org. God bless you.